So I'm going to talk about building collaborative workflows for scientific journal. Um, so I started, uh, well, if you want to find me later on the internet, that's my Twitter handle. Um, <laughs> so I'm a PhD student at uh, Kinga University in London, and uh, I'm doing a PhD in bioinformatics and population dynamics. I'm in my first year, and uh, my supervisor is Nani Kuhl. I Before, I did my master at the University of Lisbon, and uh, after that I worked a little bit in a computational biology group. So my master was in uh, biology, so I had no background in bioinformatics. But uh, the last year I stayed uh, in the computational biology group, I had to do the website for a conference. So that's where I learned all my web development skills. And uh, then um, I worked a little bit for a startup, a social network. And uh, finally I came to London, uh, first to the BDSRC grant. So, maybe, probably most of you have already seen, and I'm tired of seeing this picture. Uh, it shows the cost of sequencing, and you can see, you cannot see because it's cut, but since 2007 and uh, the cost has been dropping uh, like crazy, which means that now we have too much data, so this is the data stored in the European Bioinformatics Institute. You can see since 2008, has been growing exponentially, um, which means we cannot longer do stuff just with Windows and uh, Excel. Uh, so biologists have to start learning how to use the command line and programming and uh, how to use supercomputers. This behind us is the cluster at Sanger Institute. Uh, it is Max, the developer from that. Um, so some people learn how to program in Perl, and they think they can save the world with regular expressions. Other people le might learn Python and learn how to fight with it. Um, but the truth is, um, most of us didn't have any uh, teaching in programming, so because coding mm, is still uh, not, um, not not seen as a very valuable, or not as valuable as a paper, as a research output. Uh, we end up producing a lot of bad code, and uh, for people end up not um, uh, publishing their code somewhere. Um, or make code that is not understandable. Um, which means that we now have uh, <laughs> Reproducibility <laughs> crisis. <No laughing. laughs> so, either because the code for a particular method is not available, or when it's available, no one can actually understand it. Um, so, and the code is not the only problem, there's also the problem of the data. So, we are losing data incredibly fast because we are not storing it in the best manner or in the best place. So, in, um, we cannot access more than half of the data that was stored 20 years ago. Um, so, I think this reproducibility problem has several layers. One of them is code, the other is data. Another one is the workflow, so how you integrate code and data. And the other one is the environment where all these things happen. So I think for code, uh, possibly the best solution for the for reproducibility is to simply just use GitHub, which is what uh, has been widely adopted in open source community, although it's a company, although it's a centralized system, and maybe we might be able to come up with something things better. Right now, it works. It's the Facebook for programmers, and if everyone just uses it, it makes everyone else's life easier. Um, and you can 
if you put your code on GitHub and if you use things like testing and badges, anyone else can quickly glance at your project and see how to install it. So here I can see it's a node module. I can see that it's passing the testing. The code has 94% uh, coverage, so most of the code is tested. Uh, I can see that the dependencies are up to date. If I have questions, I can go to a chat room and ask some questions about it. And I can even cite the code, even though it's still not published. Um, so this makes everyone's life easier. Um, but I'm not here to talk about GitHub, so if you want to know more about it, there's a software sustainability institute, there's software carpentry, and there's a lot of work, workshops, talks about best practice for um, programming in science. The other layer is data, which I'm going to talk a little bit more, because I think there's a, there isn't really a solution for data right now. There's um, several places where you can host data, there's Figshare, there's database, um, but even if you release your data in those places, there will be several types of different data stored there. Um, so it's difficult to actually reuse that data, access it, transform it to something else, and that's what that is trying to solve. So that is a, a project that uh, is open source for sharing and collaborating on data. Uh, it started in August 2013. Uh, it's 100% open source, and everything we do is public. So we have our discussions on RC, on that channel, or on Gitter, which uh, is also an open chat platform. Um, so if you want to, and we also had our first community call recently, which is on YouTube. So everything we do is public, everything is open source. If you want to collaborate or discuss some ideas with us, it's very easy to reach us. Um, this is the current team, so Max Hogan uh, was the founder of that, and he and Matthias are the core developers. Uh, Porsche is working on uh, doing some integration with Python. Uh, I'm the bioinformatician on the team. There's Carissa doing uh, work on the registry for that repository. Finn is uh, the intern and is working a little bit on everything as uh, Wang is also working on special use cases. Um, so that is trying to be the git for data. Um, and the way you install that is just npm install dash g global that. You need to have the node installed first. The node is actually, it's, it's very cross platform, it's one of the most easiest. To, to, to install. Um, once you have that installed, you can do that in it, create a repository. And then you can just, <laughs> you can have a, a tool that will generate data and pipe it into that. But you cannot actually see the pipe because the pipe is abstract. But there's a pipe there. Um, and then you can do, for example, that listen, and that will start a REST server with your data. And, um, you can then access your data locally or store it on a server. And this is a web editor that comes included with that, that allows you to see the data and interact with it. But you can use any other tool or build any other tool on top of that, since that is providing the REST API. Um, if you do any change with this uh, web editor, when you save it, it will get a uh, version in that. So everything in that is version. Um, so we can keep track of all the change, kind of like GitHub does the source code. Um, so once you have the, your repository hosted somewhere, uh, if someone else wants to get a copy of that data, they can simply do that clone and the URL of your repository. You then you can just do that tool to fetch the latest change. And this is where that starts. Uh, so all these commands are very similar to Git for people that are used to it. So we are trying to uh, 
learn from their best example. But if you do that um, live, you your um, you have will be fetching the data as it's being um, inserted into the into the data repository. So if, for example, if the data is coming from a sensor or something like that, um, you can be you can have a copy of it and be fetching it in real time. Um, you can also <laughs> store files in that, so it's not just for uh, data or tabular data. You can uh, store what we call blobs of big, large objects, files. So you could actually store for those that are by implementation the FASTA file under a key called MyGenome in that and have it um, version it and you could store the metadata of that FASTA file in the Dart repository as tabular data. Um, <laughs> then you can dat cat to drop to get all the data stored and you can pipe that data to any other tool that will transform it to something else. Um, you could actually also pipe it to something that I'll talk later called Docker, which allows you to run a virtual environment. So you have a Docker container with a bunch of tools inside, and you could be piping data from that to that Docker, Docker container to run, for example, some R packets that will generate uh, a block or something. Um, so, what we have planned for that is uh, to add checkout revision so that so actually there's already a pull request for this feature that it's still being tested which means we want to be able so right now all the data in that is version but we want to be able to set the repository all the data to a specific revision to a, to a specific point in time um, so that for example if you're doing an, an analysis with some data when you start building your project or pipeline you could fix the beginning of your pipeline to that specific revision, which means that um, if they later the data change, you can always trace back uh, what happened. So um, you have control of the, of the data. Uh, we want to add that too, so that we can compare different data on, on data on repositories. That branch. Um, like on GitHub, you have, on Git you have branch, so you can be working on different uh, versions of the data. And multi-master replication, so you could have data distributed in a peer-to-peer -peer network with that. And um, simply the database, so that is not trying to be a database, it's trying to be a place where you store data repository. So then when you want to use a real database with some advanced queries, you should be able to sync that data with that uh, easily. And we are working on the registry, so there's one person uh, working on that. So we want, when we release a DAP repository, that it's announced to the registry so that anyone can easily discover it and um, clone it um, in a centralized manner. Um, so the way that stores the data is in a database called LabelDB developed by Google, but that supports other backends. So for example, when you're trying to host that on a hosting company that doesn't support LabelDB or something, you can host that uh, with a Postgres backend or with a Redis backend, and there's more backends coming. Um, you can also uh, so store the files, the blobs in that, using S3 or the local file system or BitTorrent uh, or FTP. So we want, for example, there's a lot of um, institutes that already store large data, large genomes. We don't want to, people to have to copy all that data. You should be able to just copy the metadata, have a copy of the metadata, and then access those files, those genomes, as the file, one file, remotely when you need them. So for example, you could have a DAT interface on top of an FTP server. And so that would just provide the interface layer, the uh, REST API, all the, the nice 
uh, APIs, but the data will be still start the build objects on that FTP. Um, so that features include auto scheme gener gen generation. So when you input that data into that, you don't have to give a schema, it will figure it out and store the data using Google Photo Box. Um, you get a REST API out of the box when you get that when you do that listen. And all the API is streaming. So everything that goes into that can be streamed, everything that gets out of it can be streamed. Because um, that is written in Node.js, uh, and so it's using, which is uh, a way to run JavaScript on the server using Google V8 engine, and so you have, you can use Node.js streams. So everything in that is streamable. Um, so if you want to learn a little bit more about that or try it, you can go to this URL. So uh, all the, the slides have a lot of links, so then you can access the slides there, it will be public and you can try to click on the links. This one is for the workshop that we gave at Mozilla Festival. So if you go to that link, you don't have to install anything, you get a tab, a browser tab where you have uh, a terminal, uh, a tutorial, and a text editor, and you can just play with it and try to import your own data into it, try to start a, uh, a DAT repository and see how, how it works. If you want, you can also deploy easily that without installing Node or anything. If you use, uh, for example, Heroku, which is a hosting company, they have this thing called the Heroku button. So if you go to that GitHub repository and you have a Heroku account, you can just click the deploy button and it will set up a batch for you uh, on Heroku. Is that Cloud Foundry compatible? Is that Cloud Foundry yeah, it's, compatible? It's just uh, Heroku. Okay. So it's a feature they have. So when you click this button, they'll fetch the data from the repository and it will set up um, the data repository and you just have to log it uh, into their account. And so in this case, it's using Postgres to store um, the data in Heroku. So the other layer, so that was the beta uh, problem. The other layer, I think, is the workflow. And there's several tools that are trying to solve it. There's uh, several companies trying to solve it. I'm going to talk about what I've been trying to do uh, with my own work and my uh, PhD. So I started this project called Bionode, which is uh, bioinformatics in Node.js. Um, so, Bionode is an open source project for modular and universal informatics. So that means that everything in Bionode is highly modular. Everything is a small tool that then combines them to uh, more complex stuff. And it's universal because it's in Node.js, so you can run on the browser, on the server, and um, on many platforms. So I started this at the beginning of the year. Um, and I started because when I started my research, I faced some problems. So for example, one of them was that I couldn't get relevant information from the NCBI API uh, using the existing bio libraries. So there's every language has their own bio library. That's by Python, by Ruby, by Perl. But I couldn't get easily what I wanted uh, from the NCBI API. So I had to write my own code and decided instead of writing some script, I would write a Node.js model. Um, the other thing was I was involved in a project to build a um, web app to crowdsource genome annotation. And in my group, there's a bunch of other web uh, bioinformatics projects. So I ended up having to write JavaScript. And so I didn't want to have to write JavaScript and another language. I could just write JavaScript and do everything just to reuse the same code on the browser and on the server. And um, the other thing was I thought there was uh, a difficulty in writing scalable, reproducible, and complex bioinformatic pipeline. So 
right now Bionode, most of the code is still uh, things that I did, but the Dart team, so Bionode and Dart uh, share the same archi architecture. Uh, and so we we try to, to make, so it, although they're separate projects, and they're, you, they're not coupled, so you can use one and not use the other, um, we try to inter integrate as much as we can. So Max and Matthias have been, help, have been helping me a lot with, uh, with Bionode. Recently, uh, Eric Garrison uh, started his PhD as a singer, and he has been very enthusiastic with, uh, about that and Bionode. Uh, but there's many other people that have contributed some code or have shown some interest uh, in Bionode. And we also collaborate with BioJS. So BioJS is BioJavaScript, but what they are trying to do is more visualization of biological data in the browser. While we are trying to do more, uh, more pipelines and analyzing data on the server, but at the same time be able to reuse some of the code on the browser. Uh, but we try to collaborate to avoid um, reinventing the wheel. And um, so the way you install Bionode is just like that, npm install global Bionode. Uh, and then you can do something like Bionode NCBI, download GFF bacteria, and you get all the GFF with our general file format from bacteria. Um, you can also do Binod and CDI download SRA Atropia, so you get the sequence read archives for Atropia. And you can then pipe, although you cannot see the pipe, to Binod SRA faster to them and get a faster to file from it. Uh, but if you don't want to install all Binode modules, if you're just interested, for example, in this case, in Binode NCBI, you can just install the Binode NCBI module and use just that one. So although this is all Node.js and JavaScript, all these modules, they provide a command line interface. So what you're seeing here is a command line. So you don't have to run JavaScript. You can just use uh, this as any other tool. Um, and then you can also, for example, so in this case I'm just using Binod and CDI. I'm not using Binod, and I'm searching for assemblies for hands and importing that into that and storing the JSON. So, oh, I so there's a lot of, um, so we are working on a lot of modules. So some of them are mostly uh, feature complete, although they can still be improved. Um, so the Bionode NCBI was one that I really needed to access uh, things on NCBI, so that one uh, is pretty much working. There's also been a faster parser, and this faster parser can be used on the server, but also on the browser. Um, there's a Bionode sec to do things, simple things like reverse complement, that was actually the first Bionode module because it was needed for the Afro project, so the crowdsourcing web app. Uh, but there's also some modules that are more documentation oriented, so you have a Bionode template that you can use to quick start a Bionode module uh, or bootstrap it. There's uh, also uh, JavaScript pipeline example on the Binode uh, repository. There's also a gasket pipeline. So I'll talk a little bit more about gasket later. And there's the Binode workshop that I showed um, before that you can try to, uh, to learn about that. So the, that workshop that we did at Mozilla Festival, the last step is the Binode pipeline. So if you reach the last step, you'll see how you can use that for Binode. There's other modules that I'm currently working on that I need for my research. And so these modules are mostly wrappers around existing tools, uh, C, mostly C tools. So there's an SRA wrapper, VWA, a SAM tools. Um, and there's also a parser for big bad and big read that comes from the 
the Lines project, which is a, a genome browser, a JavaScript genome browser written by Thomas Downs. So we are trying to migrate some of the parsers that he has in his uh, genome browser to Binode to make the code more modular. Uh, but a lot of people have been requesting other modules for accessing, for example, ABI, or accessing semantic resource, parsing PSF, GFF. So some people are already discussing those modules, or other have just uh, requested them and showed interest in them. Um, so why wrap all these tools with JavaScript and use them? With One reason is to have the same interface between all my modules, which are Node.js streams and uh, you know, new line delimited JSON. So I just can pipe JSON around uh, from all these tools using Node.js streams in my modules. Also, another reason is the easy installation with the Node Package Manager. This way, I can just move npm install by node sun, and I'll get some tools installed with by node. I don't have to worry about where it is installed, if the path is set up, because I'll access it through uh, BioMode, through the, the module. Um, the other reason is semantic versioning. So everything in BioMode, all the modules are, uh, are versioned, so I can control uh, what I get uh, when I install a BioMode module. I can add Tests, so most of the bioinformatics tools, they like tests. Uh, and so I can quickly add some, just to make sure that when I install it, everything is working OK. And um, I can also abstract some of the complexity of those tools. So sometimes uh, they have some parameters that don't make a lot of sense, or they need like three or four steps to reach something that everybody uses. So I can just try to abstract that un unnecessary complexity uh, with BioMod. So why Node.js? So I use Node.js because of many reasons, and one of them I already mentioned is uh, the fact that I can use it anywhere on the server side and client side. So here you have my terminal running some tests, so running the faster parser test, and it says that everything is okay. And you have the same tests, you can see that, yeah. The same tests uh, on the browser. So exactly the same code, I didn't modify anything. And I can reuse the same parser uh, on the terminal and on the browser. And although the Node.js API has some features that are not implemented in core JavaScript, I can get those features working using this tool called browser type. So with this tool, I can get my code running uh, on both sides. So as I said, I'm using this on several projects. One of them is APA, which is a web app to crowdsource genome annotation. It's a fork of the code. So I'm using mostly binary set there. In our group, we also have Gene Validator, which is a tool to quality control uh, gene predictions. So we are using SEC and binary faster. Sequence Server is uh, an easy to use plus tool. Uh, and I don't think it's using actually Binode yet, but most of the code could be replaced by Binode models. We are collaborating with BioJS, and we are trying to also to move some of the parsing from BioAlliance to Binode. So, another reason for Node.js is the package manager, that is very easy to, to use. It's very easy to install tools from Node.js. It's very easy to publish, uh, which makes uh, Node.js quite successful, and so you can see it since 2012, Node.js is the green line, and it has already surpassed in a number of modules all the other languages, because it's so easy to uh, contribute to it. So there's, in, although there's not a lot of bioinformatics in Node.js, there's already a lot of modules that can be reused uh, from the community. So there's a lot of code reuse happening on Node.js. Uh, and Another thing is that most of the modules in the Node.js community are small modules. The, the community uh, puts everything on GitHub, so everything is hosted on GitHub. Um, 
And so for most of the models, you get these badges and you can figure out what's going on. And if you can use that model, and if you use the model, and the model doesn't do what you want, it's very easy to just fork it, fix it, or change it. And if the author doesn't um, merge your change, you can just publish that model on NPM quite quickly. Or just use your fork, so you can also install uh, Node.js modules from GitHub without going to NPM. So you don't need to publish everything. You can have private modules and just install them from uh, GitHub. So another reason is that the JavaScript I benefit from other projects. So uh, I mean on the DAT team, and I use that for everything, and I integrate that with Bango. There are also, there's also BioJS. So we collaborate with BioJS. We are trying to see if BioNode can be kind of a pipeline thing and do all the analysis, and BioJS be at the end the visualization, the rendering of the data. Uh, and then there's also other interesting projects, like for example, NoteFlow. So NoteFlow allows you to build uh, a pipeline and workflow uh, interactively by driving drag and dropping models. So NodeFlow doesn't support Node.js streams yet. I think they, they, they want to do that, but they still don't support. So I had to wrap my models in a little bit of NodeFlow code, but it allowed me to build this pipeline, which uh, starts here uh, by searching uh, NCDI, and then storing the sample into a DAP repository, then fetching the reads and storing the, so this is all metadata, it's not the actual data. I just wanted to have all the metadata related to some sequencing reads. And so I start fetching everything. I fetch the papers information, the projects, the assemblies, and then I keep everything, um, all the relationship chips uh, in a graph database so I can then later uh, fetch everything back. So this is the same thing. So here I'm getting data from a DAT repository, from the sample. And I'm going to the graph database to fetch the relationship, and then getting everything from all the other repositories. So it's everything related to what I was looking for, and then quickly uh, filter it. And you can see here that, for example, if I select uh, here the, this connection, I can get uh, see the data that's coming to the pipeline. So this interface is actually quite nice too. So I can add another module here to output the data and I can figure out what's coming in and out of my pipeline. Uh, but this is just one example. I actually don't use it because it has some issues, so I just prefer to do everything on the common line. But there's some, this is a very interesting interface that would be useful for uh, biologists that are less inclined to do uh, programming. But there's all other projects, like for example, uh, Node-RED, which also allows you to build um, pipelines by drag and dropping. And then there's also simply Galaxy. So since binode modules can be used as common line tools, if you really want it, you can, for example, use them with Galaxy. Um, so I'm not too focused on all this interface because I think it's more important that we first get the backend right before we, we, we start uh, focusing too much on this interface. But it's nice that there's already a bunch of existing projects. So we don't need to, once again, reinvent the wheel. We might just integrate with one of these projects. Um, so I had difficulty getting data from NCBI uh, using the existing um, bioinformatics libraries. So for example, if I wanted to figure out where to download the genome, where the, the FTP was in Python, I would have to <coughs> then just go, yeah. I would have to write all this code uh, just to get that URL. Uh, so what I did with the uh, binary, I simplified it. So, for example, in JavaScript, I can just 
require the BIMODE module. And then I do BIMODE and CDI URLs. I'm looking for the assembly of a Chromium X, which is an ant. And then once I get that data, I'll get everything, uh, all the URLs in one object. So I can then select the first one and get the location of the FASTA file. But this, so this will get me everything. But the cool thing with Node.js is that instead I can, instead of using what we call in Node.js a callback, I can add an on event. So I can listen for the data event. So as I start getting the first uh, the first objects, I can already do something with them. I don't I don't have to wait for all the URLs. I can uh, stream the data. So if I write all my code as Node.js streams, I can also use the pipe command, and so I can just pipe everything and build pipelines in Node.js in JavaScript. So here I'm I'm, get, I'm doing the same thing, getting the URLs, and I'm piping to a function that will convert to a string, and then just uh, console all the results, so get the, an output of the results, and I'm not, so I'm not, I'm just piping everything and using the pipe command, so I can build these um, pipelines, which means it's also easy to uh, wrap my streams as command line tools, so here I'm doing the same field, but I'm using uh, bash, so I'm just piping data. Uh, the problem with using bash is that I lose some of the flexibility of JavaScript because then things can only happen in a linear way. Well, in JavaScript, I can do some crazy things. Like here, I'm requiring NCDI, I'm requiring another stream, and uh, I'm going to create two empty streams to fork the data. I'm going to start, instead of having the linear pipeline, start forking it. So here, for example, I'm doing NCDI search, and then I'm storing the reads in a dot repository, but at the same time I'm forking here on the second line. And so here, I'm continuing the pipeline. Although, so it's the same thing here. Here I'm storing, here I'm getting the same object and doing something else with it, so searching for the sample, and then storing in the sample. And then, I'm doing at the same time as this one is happening, I'm doing here another fork and looking for so linking my reads to the paper of the sequence and searching for the paper and storing. Oh, no, actually I'm here, I'm sending for another problem. So I can start doing all this crazy pipeline, which was what uh, I was doing in the NoFlow. All those forks that were happening in NoFlow feature uh, was this. So, for example, if I'm running this on the command line and I attach some counters to my uh, streams, I can actually see what's going on, and so I'm fetching, for example, sequence at 50 at a time, but at the same time I'm fetching everything related to them. Um, and if at some point there's a bottleneck somewhere, or some of these uh, functions slow down, the reads will slow down so that it doesn't break my pipeline. So the pipeline auto-regulates uh, itself. Um, so this is the same thing written uh, in Bash. So here I'm actually searching for a genome and doing, uh, aligning the reads and uh, extracting uh, and storing and aligning. So this is all Bash, just to show that I can do the same thing that I was doing in JavaScript uh, in Bash. So if you want to see these examples, you can go to these URLs, uh, that's Gasket, that's Workshop. Uh, so with Gasket, Gasket is the way to write pipelines in Node.js. Uh, but so my pipeline will be stored in the JSON file, which means I can then, for example, include this pipeline in that. And so what we want at some point to do is uh, when you get a that repository, uh, and then you do some transformation on it and you generate another repository. We would like to have a way to, to know where, what transformation happened. So you should be able to start with that repository, the pipeline. 
So gasket might be a way to start the pipeline with the repository. So you can always trace back how the data, where the data came from. And also, if you get new data into the original repository, you could then uh, have a network of connected repositories that, and you could run the pipeline, all the pipelines that are connected to generate um, the results of the other repositories. Um, yeah, so this is just uh, how the code looks like. And um, we are exploring, so the problem is uh, JSON is not very uh, user friendly, so we are exploring other things. So at this point, our code is starting to look. So this is all pseudo code; it's not real code. This is starting to look more like a make file for those that are bioinformaticians. So we are trying to make this more uh, clear. The thing with there's already a bunch of projects trying to do this. Uh, the problem is, and none of them really solve the issue of having all these complex forkings and then merging of the data. So having um, this kind of uh, map reduce happening. So we are trying to see how we can create a syntax that's easy for the users to write and to use and to understand, but at the same time provides um, flexibility of these forkings and merging. So I, I have an example here, but Eric also gave his opinion of what they think this that script should look like. So we are still trying to plan and discuss uh, where to go with this, although we are more focused on the on that environment, but uh, this seems uh, something at some point we'll have to, to look at. And so finally, the, the last layer. Uh, so once you have code uh, stored in a repository that Data stored in that, you have by mode to do the workflow. You still, uh, even if everything is reproducible, everything is version, you still want a way uh, to control the environment. Because not everyone uh, is going to install nodes, or even if it's easy, uh, things might change. So you need something that kind of locks what happened, your experiment that then you can just um, reproduce it easily. And so I think the solution is simply Docker. And a lot of people have been exploring this uh, in bioinformatics recently. Uh, so what I want to do at the end of my thesis is to be able to just do Docker run, my username, slash thesis. Uh, any, anyone should be able to get exactly the same as I, as I got. Um, so this is, I think, is the last layer of reproducibility. If every paper came with a Docker container that had everything that happened, even if it's not by node or it's another platform, even if it's some really bad code, it's still better than nothing because you might be able to reproduce it with Docker and to try to understand uh, what happened if you cannot get the same result with the same tools outside of Docker. Uh, and so for those that don't know what Docker is. Docker is just like a virtualization, like a virtual machine. You have, um, so the thing with normal virtualization is that you have your computer, your operating system, and then you have another operating system inside it, and it takes a long time to boot and to run and everything. With Docker, uh, you don't have the whole operating system. You just have, uh, Docker shares some of the components with the host operating system. So in this case, the kernel. So you don't, you just have, just the apps are different and they are contained. So it's instantaneous to spin up Docker container and spin it down, uh, unlike a virtual machine. And so for example, for things like genomics, or where you have a lot of data, uh, you don't want to have on top of all the, the data you have, all the uh, cost of the virtualization, all the slowdown, or the memory limit. So with Docker, you can uh, kind of prevent uh, <coughs> that. So, to summarize, BioNode is modular and universal bioinformatics. So, it's a set of uh, command line tools and modules that you can use on the client and server side to build uh, pipelines and workflows. 
and that. And so if you want to discuss Binode, you can come to the Binode channel on IRC, or if you don't like IRC, you can just go to this URL, uh, and it's a chat room. Um, and that is trying to be the git for data, a place where you store, or at least a layer of compatibility between all the different databases and infrastructures. And so kind of be like a, an API, an interface that you can use as a common uh, between everything, and to do version control. Uh, and you can also go to that app on RSC or the uh, chat. So I would like to thank my supervisor that allowed me to do all this kind of stuff. Uh, the DATS team, Max and Matthias and Eric, that have been showing a lot of interest in that environment recently. Queen Mary University, the US Open Data Institute that is uh, sponsoring that, and all the environmental contributors. And thank you very much, Bruno. Uh, just before we start the discussion, I would just like to present next uh, month event uh, very, very quickly. So we continue with the workflow, and we will uh, have uh, Misha, who will speak about a cloud operating system for reproducible bioinformatics. Just can have a quick look, and we'll go back to Bruno with some more questions and discussion. Yeah, everybody's welcome to... <laughs> so that's all pretty cool stuff. And then, uh, it's interesting if you do it from scale. How does it work going from, say, my laptop to the Linux server to a GCU cluster? Uh, you take more than pipelines and then find to different sets of calls, that's what Does it scale up automatically to, to change the structure or you have to rewrite the pipeline for each new uh, machine you run? So it should scale automatically. The thing with uh, where you are using uh, Spin, so with that, the way it's scaled, because it's using MDB and uh, protobufs, are very fast protocols, uh, and then everything is streams. So the thing with streams is that they do uh, they auto-regulate themselves and they do back pressure. So if one stream is slow, uh, you slow down everything. And then the thing you can do, which is really nice with streams, is that you can have the pipeline, which is a bunch of streams. Then you can have streams inside streams, and then you can have, uh, for example, concurrent streams. So if you're doing a download and you're downloading a big file, you can have uh, a stream uh, duplicated, so the same stream like 10 times, uh, to download something. So you imagine you're piping URLs. When one of those streams gets a URL, it starts downloading. When you get another URL, if that one is busy, the other one will get the URL and start downloading. So you can have like 10 lines uh, or any other number uh, doing the download or request or assembly Whatever. Uh, what we are trying to do, so right now, most of the stuff we do, so for example, in my research, I just use a big machine to do everything, but we want to use the cluster. So one of the modules that uh, we have been discussing a lot, and a lot of people are trying to come up with uh, idea of use, is the Pinot uh, sign read engine. So Pinot that will send uh, two sub tasks. So you'll get something, an object, that describes what you want to do. And by the way, you will submit the job to the cluster. Uh, and that will be waiting for the callback to come. But while it's waiting, other stuff are going on. So this is kind of difficult to do in other language. But that's like one of the things that Node.js is really good cool about. Doing all this eventing stuff and all this concurrency. Um, and so... If we get that model, um, then we can start exploring about uh, spreading to the cluster. And so the other guy I was talking to, the other day I was talking to someone that had been doing the, this kind of stream things with uh, Hadoop and Java, 
And it seems like now Java also supports somehow a mode where you can you actually also use a group called, for example, binary things. So I don't know. I, it seems interesting, but uh, uh, what's nice is that a lot of cool stuff are happening in Node.js. Um, and it seems one way to solve all this concurrency and threading. But right now it doesn't auto scale. So the streams they regulate themselves, but if I want to have ten downloads, I have to specify I'll have ten lanes downloading something or doing uh, an assembly. I just don't have to worry about when one is gonna finish or if one is taking too much that everything else is trying to fight data. Uh, because it will just pause. So in terms of reproducibility, I I published uh binary files so Something else we're not using. Um, at the moment, they would have to do some adjustment on that if they were running the infrastructure. Which is so fun. Yeah. Right. So I'm just trying to think of how far we can go. They could just run it without any adjustment and it would work, but then it might take forever to run. Uh, so, yeah, there's this uh, thing about the streams, and then the other thing is trying to make an API nice and the code nice and just being some pipes so that. Uh, at some point, we might even be able to start that pipeline as a JSON, as a task group, or anything. Just something that you can easily read and understand what's going on. And then you can, if you're interested, you can look inside each module and see what's going on. And you can attach uh, other events like printing to the console or sending an email when something happened in the pipeline. Uh, so it's, I, I really like it because it feels like uh, Unix pipes, but it's a lot more flexible. Uh, do all the modules have to be written entirely in JavaScript? Because most of the implementations here work in other languages. And it'd be nice if you could use your wrapping, your communication, but use the fast C libraries and rules being useful. Because otherwise, you're not going to get a lot of us to contribute. Anything. So that's what we are trying to do. There might be a way to get away with it, which is uh, so right now I've been wrapping C to JavaScript. So the C code running, but it's running on the server, which is fine. But if I wanted for some reason to run it on the browser, it wouldn't work. But you can write C code that runs on the browser because it will run inside the Chrome V8 engine. You could actually write C code with V8 uh, binding. And so this C code should be fast uh, as much as. It supports it, but for uh, all the binary stuff and all the JavaScript model, they, they won't tell the difference between a JavaScript or C code with binary because at the end everything runs in the V8 uh, engine. So you could require C code in a JavaScript library or in binary. And on server side, could you allow more than just C? On server side, you can pretty much do. Anything that you can so to run. Run. Yeah. You could run Python, R, whatever, but you run. One thing we are trying to see is for all of these small phrases, so we don't want to run everything. Um, so if you have like a very complicated R pipeline that does something that doesn't run, you could just like put that uh, pipeline in a Docker container. So we are trying to see how we can integrate Docker into all these pipelines. So you could be piping. Data from that, doing something with binary, and then piping to a Docker container at the end, or in the middle, but you do something else. So that could be one way to write other language uh, with this pipeline system. So going back to that. Um, a few simple questions, hopefully. Are there any limits on the amount of data that you can store? And what sort of controls do you have on access? For example, you know, in scientific collaborations, we're not going to share the data until it's published. This sort of thing. You know, those usual sorts of things. So I think the limits will probably be level DB limits, which I don't know what are, but I know that that is in the real world. 
that I'm working with that for my informatics, but that is working for a bunch of other stuff. So we have um, people from this, from CERN, from physics. That's right. Is there right. a quote in the search? Is there a quote in the search? I know we are storing data sets from Galaxy in that. So I don't know how big that is. Uh, I can tell you later. <laughs> I can ask Matt and tell you later. But um, yeah, we're supposed to, to, to start really a huge amount of data, really. Right? Um, as for access control, you, you can now set. Um, Uh, permissions or administrative permissions so that no one can push to your repository, but, but anyone can push. So we don't have private repositories yet. That's something that people have been asking about. Uh, so we need, we need to add some layer of privacy in that. Right now, when you, if someone knows the URL, they can push. They cannot push if you have a password set. But uh, we need to implement uh, some privacy. And that might eventually also come in the registry. So, yeah. so right now, if you need to start something, you need to create a DAC and host it somewhere. Um, but then one knows where it is. So we want to solve that with the registry. And we also want to try to come up with some partnership some hosting companies so that uh, new users could like, have one gigabyte or something like that so, uh, space to quickly require that and start playing with it uh, without having to set up their own host. But we don't want to store like NCBI on that. We would like NCBI to then have a that way uh, use that. But uh, we also don't want them to put all their uh, and some into that, we should access that with remote uh, logs. But it is, is the storage delocalized? So could they just allocate some of the NCBI data as we need that? And it just fits into the Google Cloud and everything, so it doesn't take up any extra space. Is that an idea? So the idea would be it wouldn't take the space of the blocks, the blocks would be just remote. So there would be just data in that. We could create the space of the, the metadata. So the thing that we would like is then, then what we can have is the uh, NCBI version. You can have like uh, trace back. So when you start an experiment problem right now, if you start something with NCBI, uh, it might be reproducible now, but in three months or something, it might not be because they'll change the data on their side. So actually, my binary NCBI model has some small tests that just fetch something from NCBI, just fetch test that it's working. And the tests are broken several times because NCBI changed something on their side of data. Uh, and I, now I know it because I can see my tests breaking all the time. And I can figure out what changed. It's one uh, value somewhere or something, some keyword that changed. Uh, but the thing is that all those changes are happening silently. Uh, and you don't have a log of that, so if that was on top of it, you could have all this change uh, traced. Uh, and when you start something, a project, you will just fix to a specific uh, revision of that. So you know that everything you build downstream uh, is locked to that data set. So that then if it breaks, you can do diffs, eventually at some point and figure out what changed and what's breaking your platform. One tiny question to follow it up. Is the level of the metadata sort of like this is an E. coli gene, or this is E. coli GFF, or is it at the gene level? How detailed is the metadata that you get? You can be whatever level, whatever you want. A level you want. Right now I'm just I'm just getting NCBI data, converting all that stuff into JSON and storing the JSON as is. But you could um, so there's been some people trying to for example store VCI files. That. So it could be at whatever level you, you want. As long as you choose the appropriate level for the appropriate level. And for, um, for experiments. So, and that's the thing, depending on the experiment and the question you're trying to answer, you might need a different level. 
that you should be able to, if you create another repository, be able to trace back what transformation you did to create another one. And so you, then you start having all these forks uh, that are appropriate for a specific use case that you can always trace back where they came from. And it's not someone doing some transformation on that side. <laughs> so you talked about the different aspects of, I guess, the work, people's workflow and how they're doing that. So you really talk about that screen interface and how you interact with, how say, if I was just going to come up, okay, you might understand your workflow without having to write a code, but you need to do visualization and do explore the data interacting with you, you want to have that sort of combination of visualization and exploration. <coughs> so we are not we are not focusing on the visualization because there's, we still have a lot of work right on this stuff. There's a lot of people doing the visualization stuff. Uh, but if you go to NoFlow and if you go to some of their examples, they have some examples. So NoFlow is completely unrelated to us. It's another project. But in their pipeline, you can you have an example. Of it. I think it's with image transformation, something like that. So you have an image or video in real time, and depending on how you change the pipeline, you get the output in real time change. So I guess that could be easily adapted to something that. Uh, yeah, especially if you want to get up while just on paper, to actually really use the system and use the same. Yeah, be interactive. So and, and, and have that have that aspect of it as a control project would be very valuable. Yeah, and um, the cool thing with that is since that provides a rest of you can do whatever you want on top of it. So we have the DAT editor, which is a very simple spreadsheet. As you could build some different visualization or any other thing on top of it. Um, but yeah, I agree that the interactive part is very important to be able to change something and see in real time what you're doing and exploring the data. Yeah, that's something that's very hard to do. So, so I'm struggling a little bit to see what the advantages of that are over with uh, and why you find it necessary to re implement a lot of the different functionality for the project. I can store CSVs and TSVs. Git, I can store spreadsheets in Git, Excel files. I can even store small SQLite databases in Git and do version control with that. Now it would be hard to compare versions, um, but I can do the kind of thing of storing metadata into blocks of data elsewhere in a Git repository. It might be that smooth or streamlined, but I could do it. So, what, what are the things that you can't do with Git that you felt like? And you really had to re-implement all of these basic version control functions and, and do it in completely different ways. So if you try to store real user metadata, it's just kill the uh, git because it is meant for code. Um, but if you try to actually store, you know, when you do unit, some, if you just store some kind of very large file, you just kill it. You cannot do any full work. Full work, full work, full work. Um, and yeah, and Git is focused on, uh, on the versioning of the lines, and so that um, it, you can store which are Postgres, Adam, in Git, and all that stuff. Um, but it, that is focused on, on the data, so you get versioning of the actual data. You can then do the things like the, the streaming and the live tools. Uh, so you can have sensors uh, fetching data in real time on some animal or some meteorological station or something like that. And you could have that being done in real time into that and fetching and cloned in real time. Uh, and you cannot achieve this kind of, kind of real time things with it. You could try to solve the issues that you have with the huge amount of data, but I think we'll be fighting the system. Um, because at the end, what's behind that is level D. So it's a uh, real database. Uh, and you can also run it uh, on the browser, which means 
Uh, right now, you use that mostly on the server, but you could do some really cool stuff on the browser. So, for example, have peer-to-peer -peer that repositories in your browser. So, you could be doing, for example, um, a genome annotation or something like that. And when you save it, it will be shared with everyone in this room um, to that in the browser uh, without accessing anything on, on the server. So Matthias, for example, he has been doing some really crazy stuff with um, streaming data from torrents, that, so mounting torrents that you're fetching on the file system or mounting them in that. So they're doing some really crazy stuff with peer-to-peer -peer connections on torrents. And, um, and you can do all that stuff using Node.js and MongoDB and all those new tools. If you were using something like Git, you will be locked um, with that technology. And Git works very well for its purpose, which is code. Um, so we are just taking the same API, but with different technology. No, you can store, you can store all the block files, you can see the plan, whatever. I mean, well, you can't, but then, I mean, the kind of stuff going in that room, but where it's not so good for me. Because, I mean, like, you could, I mean, so you once, could, once you guys are using protobuf or whatever, so you start structuring the data, right? So the, the advantage comes when you start seeing the structure, right? Mm -hmm. If your data is kind of being I think you can just store anything. It depends on what you want to do after with the data. You just want to have the bound file because you're going to need them at some point. You just store the box. But if you want to actually have the information, you can, for um, example, have the zip file. You could gzip them, gmzip them in real time in Node. So Node has, also has an implementation of in core of gzip. So you could just stream all that stuff and put into that. I think if you're really looking for limitations, I'm sure there is, there's always limitations to everything. You should look at LiveODB and protobuf limitations. Because that's the. That's when you reach the technology limitations. Right now, I don't think, for all the use cases people have been discussing. So that's another thing. If you have any use case, you can discuss on all the chats uh, which I posted. But you can also just go to the repository and open an issue and explain what you're interested, what you would like to do, what's your project. Uh, um, and we can discuss that. So we have a lot of, we have several use cases like that. Some from RNAC, some from Galaxy data and physics, anything. So I have a question about, yeah, is it, is it a useful tool for data exploration? Say, if I have a bunch of data coming in as a JSON stream, mm -hmm. um, I know I can view it in the browser um, as, as a table, but is there any further functionality as like an issue in select statements that you would in SQL in order to query that data? Or, um, do you have to necessarily use Node.js to stream it out again to, to do something with the data? So that has basic index that you can use to fetch particular data. So for example, in the case of galaxies, the problem was the, the use case they presented to us was that to fetch a solar system, you have to actually fetch the whole galaxy the way they have their data. Uh, organized. So if you store it in that, you don't have to do that because you can specifically go to a region of your that. But um, that, so that doesn't have a lot of secondary index. Like that. We are going to be planning on implementing that, so you can do some more advanced queries. We also don't want to build another database 
Uh, so we don't want to build very complex queries functionalities. And then at that point, we start reaching the level where you need to actually run a real database. So you use that just as the repository, but then you get the data out of it into a real database and do some more advanced queries. So what, 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 I'm, what I'm trying to get is really how do you draw the line between a data repository and a database? I mean, I, I sort of seem to understand both, but um, like... Hmm? A repository is, an, uh, so a database has a schema, you know, each row contains a link. But a repository is just a collection of that. Well, yes. so is probably every NoSQL database, right? Oh, well, you can, so, with a repository, it's like code. It doesn't care about the schema, whatever you're giving it. You just give it something, and it versions it. Um, and you can do some queries, basic queries, uh, based on some index. Um, but that's it. You cannot do very complex exploration or going in, inside nested properties or, or things like that. That's when you start to have an actual database with a bunch of more complex index, and you start having to, to need a SQL database and have a bunch of uh, relations or things like that. So it's, we, we want to add queries that are simple to add, well, first level, but uh, not provide you, I don't know, it's something like map or something inside the, that. Yeah, at that point, you need to get the data out of that and do something with it. Mm -hmm. So that, that should just be really good at keeping the data being fast, getting it in and out, versioning it, and distributing it. Okay. You should be able to, because then if you start having something too complex, when you do a dark clone, it will take forever, because it has to be a bunch of crazy stuff. Okay, uh, thank you very much. You're most welcome to stay over and just uh, have a nice chat and uh, Bruno will stay for some more time. Uh, thank you very much for coming and again if you have uh, uh, ideas or things you would like to present to, to the group, uh, be in touch. Thank you. <laughs>